Hello everyone, hello members. Welcome back to another event on our ladies. Today we have Dr. Grasso from British Columbia. She's a open source mentor and she'll be taking us through version control in Git, which is a very interesting topic. Anyone who's in computer science or any of the sciences will know that keeping, uh, keeping our documents from what we did before and tracking changes basically is very helpful. So she'll be taking us through the commands and there is an easy pad that we'll post again in the chat. So we'll just be posting all our commands and everything we do uh, in the talk. And we'll also be posted. Let me just also add the GitHub account for our ladies. If you're interested in any of our previous talk or previous events and material and notes, you can follow it through this. So, yeah, Grasa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Simi. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Um, I'm really excited. Um, and since you said that uh, many participants are beginners in Git and GitHub, I my presentation is focused on the structure and how GitHub, actually how Git works. Um, and how we can make better decisions on what to do in each time that we face a conflict or um, we need to update our changes. Um, so I'm going to share the screen. Uh, and feel free to take notes on the etherpad. This yeah. document is for you. Um, I will probably share a, maybe a PDF version of the pre presentation if you want. Mm -hmm. um, that sounds good as well. Is it working? Do you see everything? Yeah, I see it. It's good. Okay. Uh, and I don't see the chat. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question or I won't stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, all right. Uh, so today we're going to discuss a little bit about Git and how it works to travel in time to see our changes in our documents. Uh, I won't focus on comments and actually the buttons to click, but uh, on the structure. Uh, you can find me at this handle, Graciela Gino, at GitHub, Twitter, almost everything. And if you need, if you have any questions after the talk, you can always contact me and send emails. I'm free <laughs> to answer these questions. Um, so um, when we work in our computer, when we are creating code or writing a manuscript or doing something, we create folders, we create documents, and we store all that in, in a kind of container, a virtual container. And from now on, we are going to refer to that as a repository or repo. So a repository is a virtual container that contains all files of a project, right? Um, and it works really well. We do that all, all the time. So we add new folders, we add documents, uh, we delete things, we include new things, and that's um a normal workflow and it works really well until we have different copies of the same file so sometimes we make a change and we make a copy of this file and we but it, we name it differently to um to describe that we have a change and that's something different with this file but then we end up with a messy <laughs> folder and we don't know which fo which file is the newest or the most final and all that and that generates confusion and that's where git comes in handy because with git we don't store versions of files we store the history of each file um, so with git we can record when we created something when we deleted each line when we edited and we can go back and forth in this story of this uh, document to revisit the story. Uh, so we do that through things that we call commits. 
So each change that we do in a document, uh, we attach a message to it and we commit it to a timeline. I'm going to talk about it in details later. So the, uh, the, the main message is that um, we can collaborate because as we start the story of a file, we don't start versions. We can um, include collaborations of different people in the same file in different uh, points in time. There are uh, resources online that do that, like Google Docs and Dropbox. They, they store the version control of each file. We can revisit in time when things change it, changed but um, they are really simple tools and we get we can do that in a way that that is more complex um okay so <laughs> usually the workflows starts like this we are here working in our computer and we create a new file with git we need to tell the computer to start tracking this file so we use these commands that is we usually say git add and then the name of the file. So with this command, git will start uh, watching this file. So each change that we do in each line, uh, if we delete it, if we change the, the directory, uh, git will detect it and will tell us, hey, you changed this thing. You want me to save it to store this change? Do you want me to save this thing this change in the storyline of this document. And then when we do this, when we ask Git to watch this document, Git puts this file into a, something that we call a stage area. A stage area, area is an area where Git is watching and storing the changes ready to be committed to a storyline. So what we can do when we want to revert that is to use this command called git reset head and the name of the file. This command will take the, the changes and the file that is being watched from the stage area back to a place that is not, how can I say that, where the changes are not fixed in story and start in the storyline of the document. So it's back to, a, to an area where we can uh, further edit the document without messing up the story of the document. So that's a way to go back in time. One way to go back in time in the story of the document. Okay, but let's assume our document is now in the stage area. We ask it to watch the, the, the document and the changes that we made in the document, and it's now in the stage area. The next thing we need to do is to commit these changes. So we use this command, git commit with the flag M and the message. This is a message that will describe what we did with the document. Uh, so it's really a short message with an action verb that will describe and be clear about what we did with the document. And then the document will leave the stage area and will be related to a tag. That's a code, that's a unique code for each change that you commit. Usually it's a very long code, like I think like 20 something algorithms, but you can refer to that with the six digits code that is the same thing. Uh, so after that, now our document is committed and has a tag. Um, and with this command git commit, now it's in a timeline. This change that we made is on a timeline. And we, this timeline we call branch. And we can now add different um, different versions of the same document. And each edit that we do, each version in time, not in space, 
against a different tag. So we can refer to exactly this, uh, this point in time using these different and unique tags. Small tips for best practices when we are committing and staging files. So the main thing is to write short messages with action verbs. So for example, you say fix import data code, not um, trying something. <laughs> that just be really clear with short messages using verbs that will describe really clearly what you want to do, what, what you did actually. Another tip is always trying to commit every single change. So each time you do something in your code that is working and you save the code, you try to stage this change and add a commit message to it. Or you can group save change by theme. For example, a lot of times I'm trying to improve a plot, for example, a, 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 a scatter plot or a map or something. Um, and then I do a series of changes that they work independently, but they have the same goal. So I try to uh, save every time and stage every time, but only commit when my plot is ready, because that makes the storyline cleaner. Um, and so I don't think it will make sense for me to save a specific version of the document and go back to it if the code is not making sense in this in its completion you know um, another thing that you can do is add emojis for fun and quick references so some teams have um, internal codes uh, using emojis so for example when they added something they add an emoji that it's a pencil so you don't need to read the commit message to understand that that commit refers to an edit in a text file. Uh, and another thing that's really, really important is to pay attention to large files. So usually uh, we use Git with uh, an online platform such as GitHub or Bit Bitbucket and things like that. Um, and these platforms are not designed to store files or store large files. They are designed to manage your project and store uh, small files such as text files and scripts and manuscripts. So if you need to version control large files, uh, you can use some tools inside GitHub such as LTS, I think. It's a large file manager for GitHub. Uh, but the best best practice is to store your large files in another place and use your code to refer to the, these large files that are stored in another place. Um, so it, it's a case by case situation, but uh, pay attention because sometimes we try to commit large files and our commit kind of breaks. We can't push the changes to the cloud because of that. And you have to revert and it's a mess. <laughs> so avoid that. Okay, so now we know how to commit and how these things work in our local computer. So all that that I explained until now, it's happening in our, in our computer. Uh, so the next step is to put that changes in a remote repository. So it, it's safe and it's shareable with our colleagues, colleagues so we can collaborate. Um, and to do that, we use this famous command called git push. This makes the changes that are in our computer go to the cloud. And the opposite way, when we want to retrieve changes from a remote repository, we use this command called git pull. So best practices in this in both of these commands and pushing and pulling uh, is always starting your day with git pull. So you have the most up-to-date repository in your local computer um, and always finish your day with git push. So you always make sure that all the changes that you made are safe and stored safely in the cloud. Uh, but don't wait until the end of the day to push your changes. 
push as often as you can. Every time you do big changes and you commit something, try to push to the cloud so your changes are safe. So you, if your computer breaks, suddenly you have a copy online. Uh, okay, so right now we have different versions of our single document. Each version has a tag and it's all in a timeline that we call branch. What we can do is create another branch to develop another part of our document. So for example, if we have a script and we are dealing with data, we have this main branch and we can create a new branch just for data cleaning. So in this branch, I will only do changes in the files that are related to data cleaning, not related to plots, for example, or uh, analysis. And then in this new timeline, I will do the same thing. I will make a change. I will add this change stage and commit. And then you will create a new timeline with new tags and new versions of this file. But now is when we have real fun because now we have different timelines and the same file in different versions in different timelines and how we deal with that. Uh, there are a lot of problems that can arise from that and it will be really important that the project manager uh, knows how to take decisions and how to manage the branches, especially when we are collaborating with a large team, large team, sorry. So the first situation is when we have these two timelines, we have a change here in the same file, and then someone makes another change in the main branch, the same file. What we can do, one option, is to use git rebase. Git rebase is a command that takes the orig origin of the branch that you are working on to a newer commit in the main branch. So for example, if this branch called data cleaning comes from this branch called main, if, you, if we come back here one slide, you see that I created this branch called data cleaning from after this commit 765. If I use git rebase, my new branch data cleaning will have this change 765 and will have this change 665 because it will now begin in another point in time in the main branch. It's a little complicated, but it's like, you take a branch and you just move the orange in time further to the future. Okay, another thing that can happen is that, okay, now you have a change in the data cleaning, you have another change in the main branch. Another thing that you can do is to use git merge. When you do git merge, uh, Git will compare these two branches and will detect whether you have changes in the same in the same part of the document. So if you have changes in the same line, for example, it will detect and will emerge a conflict. If not, it would be good to go. Git will merge automatically the changes and you have a beautiful document here after this commit called 43E. So when you merge, you create a commit in the branch that is being merged. So I'm, I'm merging data cleaning into main. So I create a commit in the main branch. It's clear, it's confusing. Kind of. <laughs> It's okay so far, we're following. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so in this second situation, we merged both branches and now we don't have the data cleaning branch because all the changes are now in the main branch. 
another situation is when okay so now we have this data cleaning branch with a change the main branch with another change instead of merging and instead of rebasing now we do a pull request a pull request is a tool that will allow us and other people to first check for conflicts review the documents add comments um, fix bugs um, and see all the changes that I made in this commit here, in this commit 6YT. Um, and that will guarantee that when I merge to the main branch, I will have less conflicts because I will be, I will reveal everything. Uh, other people will take a look and I will be able to compare my changes with the changes in the main branch before merging. So it's always a good practice to pull request first instead of merging um, without pull request. <laughs> so after a pull request, uh, someone reveals the codes and then approves the merge to the main branch. And then I create another commit because every time I merge, I create a commit. A commit is just a, um, how can I say that? It's like a timestamp. Yeah, so it allows you to go ahead with a, with a certain change. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So you change things and then people review it and then you, hey, can I merge this thing into this, yeah. this range? And then the other reviewers will say, okay, <laughs> go ahead. Hey, Grasel, I have a question. Sure. Yeah, so um, we talked about having a branch for a different for for different versions. How many branches can you have for one version? Or is it that you only have a branch for certain versions? No, it actually when you create a branch, you create a version of the whole project. You can create as much as you need. Okay. There's no need. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, usually, so that's another thing when you are managing a project, uh, that's something I think I mentioned later. Uh, it's important to have a plan on how you are going to create branches and merging branches. So for example, um, once I uh, collaborated in a paper, we were writing a paper in GitHub uh, and we decided that we would create branches for each section of the paper. So there will be a branch, a main branch that is not the main, main timeline. It's another main branch for like the introduction. And then from this main branch of the introduction, each collaborator would create another branch for their own writing. So I would have introduction, Gracieli. So that's the branch where I would make the changes to the introduction. And then everyone comes together, merge the changes, and creates only one version of the introduction. And then later, <laughs> we would merge all that into a paper. <laughs> right. So. Is it possible to set a notification in Git to tell to let to let you know if someone has made a change, or is it like when like is it like in Google Slides or in Google Sheets when someone when we're all working on it, then you just have to check on it but there's no notification? No, I, I guess it depends on your preferences and your settings. Um, oh, right. okay. Yeah, I know, I remember I, I used to receive notifications when people modified files that I created, but I think it depends on your settings. Janelle, have you used, have you gotten any notification when you're using Git? Okay, so if I'm following someone, um, someone's GitHub repository, um, then I receive, it's the settings, uh, as Graciela said, then I receive notifications when someone makes a comment or a change on that other person's repository. Um, but I haven't used that function with a colleague. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. I see. So but it's useful. <laughs> 
Oh yeah, it would be useful. So everyone else who's, who else is here, participants, if you have anything to add, please feel free. Awesome. Okay, so any other questions, comments? No, not just now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, like there. <laughs> so as I was saying, best practices in branching. Uh, the main thing is use the main branch only for fundamental changes. So the main branch is the kind of the root of a project. If you make any change that you made in the main branch is going to be reflected in the other branches and what people see from your project. So be careful when you merge changes to the main. Uh, when working on teams, always have a convention for naming the branches. So for example, and, and you can also nest branches using uh, slash, I think it's slash call. <laughs> Uh, so, for example, when I, as I was mentioning, we decided in this project, in this paper that I was writing, to name everything that is related to the introduction of the paper, we use this intro slash something, or our names, or the topic that we are writing, or anything. We created this convention in the beginning of the project. Uh, pull requests are safer only merge final changes so always try to instead of merging unless it's your project and you are doing something that you are going to manage if you're collaborating always try to pull requests and maybe tag someone to review your changes we can we'll go through that when we are i'm planning a github tour for the end of the session <laughs> and then i can show you how to do it um, and always branch to test new things, never doing on the main branch. So if you have a new piece of code that you want to try out, it's always safer, safer to create a new branch to change it. And if you, if it's your project and you feel comfortable doing it, to just copy paste the changes that are working in the main branch if you don't want to merge it. But not a good practice. But if it's your project, <laughs> it's your convention. Um, okay. All right. So uh, now I'm going to explain a little bit about uh, how it works to communicate your local repository to the remote repository. Uh, so we saw that when you are on your computer and you need to upload the changes that you made to the cloud, to your online repository, you push things. But sometimes you have an online repository and you want to copy these files into your computer. That's what we call clone. So when, you, when we use the command git clone, we are just copying an online repository into our computer. Another thing that we can do is uh, take other people's online repository and make a copy online to our own account. We call that fork. Fork is different from cloning because they are related to the original repository in different ways. Um, cloning is always from, the, from a remote repository, from the cloud to your local computer. And forking is always between clouds, between remote repositories. So you're making online copies of a repository. Um, and the forked repository is connected to the original repository in a way that you can retrieve the, the newest changes, the updates that people made in their repositories that you forked from into your repository. And you can easily make changes in your copy and pull requests to the original repository. So that's how people contribute usually. So instead of making a big, big project with uh, thousands of contributors with their own branches, people copy the repository, develop something, and then pull requests to the original repository. It's a more organized way to collaborate in really, really big, big, big 
projects. Um, so, as I said, <laughs> when you want to uh, add chains from your online repository to other people's repository, you do this pull request. A pull request is uh, basically a merge commit. So, you are asking someone to merge the changes that you made into some branches, into one branch of their repository. So that would be a commit message, that would be a commit tag. It, it works the same way, but it's just a request to pull these changes into their branches. So the general architecture now is, um, sorry, I miss something, it's not the way. Uh, so other people's online repository and you have your online repository, you can fork their repository into your online repository. And when you want to make changes into their repository, you make a pull request. When you want your online repository to go into your computer, you clone it. And then your changes go from your computer to the online repository through a push and the other way through a pull. Let's take a breath. <laughs> Let's roll, uh, I'll open our studio. If you have our studio and you want to follow along, feel free to do it. Disclaimer, my Git and our studio is, they are already conf uh, configured from my account. So I, thought that it would be better to, to skip this step because it's really time consuming and there are a lot of errors that occurs. And since we don't have that much time, I thought it would be better to just explain how things work. Okay, so we have this, this is the initial interface of the RStudio. Um, and as you know, we can create new files here, new documentation, and we can create a new project. So when we ask our studio to create a new project, you have the option to create a new directory or visual control. This option here takes you to an option to clone a repository to your computer and start a project there. So if you already have a repository online, you go here and then you copy paste the URL of your repository here. And um, the name that will be the the subdirectory name of your folder, the new folder. And then you create a project. If you don't have an online repository, which is what we are going to do now, you go to this new directory option. And then you can choose what you're going to do. I chose new project. I will call this project our ladies. And then I check this box here, create a Git repository, create project. So now I have an Our Ladies project here, and he already created a Git, Git, Git Ignore. <laughs> Sorry. This file is really cool. Um, so everything that you add here, it's a text file. You can add text here, text, you know? Uh, so everything that you add here will be ignored by Git. So every time you do a commit or every time you do a Git add, it will read this file and ignore the changes in these kinds of files. So every time we do our, our project, we create these point our data, point our history files that are not um, relevant to the story of our project and they are created every time that we run the code or we can do for example csv and we'll ignore all csv files in our project it will only upload the dot r files and then i made a change and saved the changes and if you notice when we create a project that is related to Git in GitHub. Now we have this tab here called Git. 
and it detects what's new, what's changed in my local repository. Uh, and now here, there are all the vocabularies that we talked about. So co commit, stage, branches, it's all here. So let's do that. Let's do a quick tour on GitHub and then we can do the other way. So we create a remote repository and clone it to our local computer using RStudio. So this is when you log in to GitHub, this is your homepage, this is your dashboard. You can just go here, new, and that's the page to create a new repository. Uh, so you can use a template. I won't use any templates. I will do our ladies. Gabo. Me. Oh, it's available. <laughs> um, test repository. As a description of the repository, I'll make it public. I'll add a readme because it's good practice. Add a geek git ignore i think there's our template here oh yeah r and i'll choose a license cc oh there's no cc i'll choose a license leader then create repository there it is so now we have an online repository so here are it's kind of how you explore files in your computer. So you have these new two files that I created when I created the repository. Uh, usually you see the readme file here in the beginning. So this is an important file for you to describe what your project is about and put links to the website and to the contribution guidelines and all that. Uh, you can add files here in this button upload files or create new file. When you create a new file, you have the option to, for example, uh, who am I? Let's put am I. And then you can put the extension here. So I'll do a markdown file and I'll create this file with my name. And then here you have a space to make your commit message. So here there's this uh, default message, create whoami.md, and you can just add a description, um, said who I am, and then who is responsible for this commit, and then the option to commit directly to the main branch or create a new branch and start a pull request as I suggested before. But since this is my project, <laughs> it's my main branch, I, it's, it's the first setup for the whole project, I will commit directly to the main branch. Then I click here, commit new file. And now I have this new file here with the commit and the file. If I click on the file, I can see what I just did. Here you see the tag that I mentioned before. So it's a tag that brings me to the state of the repository in this commit. So if I change more than one file, they will be attached to this same commit. And now you see here the parent commit, which is the commit that gener that was right before this new commit. So you're traveling time back in time. Then you can just come back. Uh, what else can we see here? You, you have these two options to view the differences, which is un unify and split, but this only works, it works better when you have other versions of the same file. Since this is the creation of a new file, it won't work that well. So back to the main repository page, uh, there are other things here that you can edit in the configuration. You can add a website, uh, keywords and all that. Um, here you can see the branches. So you can create a new branch here. And now I have two branches. 
you can see here on the side that I have two branches and I'm now on the on the branch that I just created. If I do some changes here in this file, I go here, edit this file. And I do an editing Vancouver. Add address. So I added a new message to a commit to this file. And here appears the option commit direct to the Graciele branch, which is the branch that I just created. So I commit the changes to this new branch. And then if I go back to the main page, now I, I see this alert here saying that now my branch has a commit that the main branch does not have. And now I have the, the option to compare and pull requests. If I click there, GitHub will detect that it doesn't have conflicts, so it's able to merge right away if I want. So implementing the change that I made in the new branch in the main branch, um, I can assign reviewers here since I don't have collaborators in this uh, repository, they will show here, but once you do, you can just type name here. Wait. Oops. Like the name is the people or the handle, you can put handle and the username and they will be here. Um, and who's responsible for handling these pull requests. You can assign yourself and you can put labels. So you can tag, for example, um, first milestone or deadline in December or uh, for grant X. And then you can relate these pull requests to a project, which is something that we can see in a minute. You can add milestone, which is something that it's inside projects. Um, yeah. And also you have the option to create a draft pull request. This means that you are still working on the changes that you made, but you want people to pay attention to it or uh, call people to contribute. So you can create a draft pull request. I'll do that. So it's a pull request to the main branch, but it's still a work in progress. Uh, I think we are <laughs> almost uh, at the time, but I'll rush a little bit. Um, another yeah. important thing in the repository. Is... Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying you have like 30 minutes. So there's plenty of time. Oh, OK. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so another really important thing in managing a repository is the issues, the issue tab. So the issues is everything that you need to implementing your codes, anything that you need to implement, think, uh, tests that you need to do, but in your code that, in your code that you need to solve. So uh, you can create new issues and relate labels and milestones to each issue. So for example, to create a new issue, you can just say, uh, hey, it's missing a date, for example. And then here you describe the problem, what, you're, what you need to do. You can create a to-do list and then you can check them out when you do it. And then you can tag people, you can format the message. Once again, assign people and assign labels, then submit new issue. Now you have kind of a to-do list something it's a problem that it's open needs to be solved and then when you do it you can i mean github detects what's a to-do list uh the formatting and all that so this is a good tool for you to manage tasks and things that need to be done um problems to be solved in your code and to we to ask people to help you um so another thing interesting where uh, here so you have milestones milestones it's a 
really cool thing to manage your project. So when you create a milestone, you can put a title. So for example, deadline for project X, and then you create a due date, which is really cool. So next week we have deadline for project X. We describe here what it means. We can link to issues. We can link to files here in the description and then create a milestone. Uh, now you have kind of, kind of a project management thing. The milestones are related to your issues. So when you close an issue that is related to a milestone, it shows that you are progressing in your projects. Let me see here, go back here. So here, um, this, uh, this line here, it begins to get fulfilled. And then when the, the milestone is complete, all the tasks are complete, you have the option to just delete or create a new one or change the date. Um, another thing that you can do here is create wikis. So wikis are kind of documentation for your project. Uh, you can manage the security of your repository. So you can uh, copy code here for the systems and how your repository operates in terms of security. You have this insights thing which is a really cool thing that shows who contributed the most to your code um how here i like this one not this network network shows how your branches are connected so you have the main branch and the commits each little sphere like this it's a commit so each change that you made in a file um, and then this thing can get really complex, but it's a way for you to visualize how your project is developing. And in settings, you can manage the collaborators, which is uh, the team that is working on your repository. You have many other options on how to um, manage your repository, and you can create a web page for your special project. I see something in the chat. They use this package, thank you. <laughs> um, what else? Uh, I think that's pretty much it. Oh, and here is the option to fork a repository. If you go exploring GitHub, and you see a cool repository, you can see this button here and just click fork. And then GitHub asks where you want to fork or copy this repository to. So here I have different organizations. It doesn't show the option to fork to my own profile because this is my own <laughs> um, repository. But I could fork it to this other organization that I'm part of, for example, and then I can change the repository name or maintain the same name. Uh, and then I just click here, create fork. Uh, I have the option to make this repository my favorite or to watch the, the modifications. So this is something that we were talking about earlier in the configurations about the notifications. Um, you have the options here to get notifi notifications every time someone mentions you or every time someone is mentioned or for all activities for, or you have the option to ignore, never be notified about it if it's your repository, where you can customize the notifications. Um, what else? Yeah, so that's an online GitHub repository, we can clone in. Now, it's, is there any questions, something that you wanted me to explore or explain? How Gitmoji works in R Studio? 
that's a good question i i mean kids and kids i think right uh usually when you do a commit message if you use the code of the emoji let's see here you see this um two points or two points if you copy this thing in your commit message it won't show up in the command line in the terminal but on github it, it will render as an emoji so it's something that sometimes it doesn't appear but depending on which tool you're using for example i use v vs code more than our studio and we can just copy paste the the emoji there uh questions no okay um so let's try to quickly clone this repository into our studio so to clone a repository you go here in this green button you have the option to clone you can just click here in this two squares thing is going to copy this address i recommend just always clicking here instead of copy pasting because i had many problems trying to copy paste here <laughs> instead of clicking here uh, copy or you can just download everything as a zip file but let's copy here this address and then go back to our studio and now we'll go back to new project version control clone a project from a git repository and then we paste here the thing that we just copied from the online repository and then we name the directory name and then create projects so now we have a local copy of our remote repository. See that we have the same files that I created online with the same text. Um, and probably now we are going to be able to push and pull. Uh, let's make a modification here. Today is April 30. Save and now it appears on Git. I'll stage everything, commit, add new info. Let's try to put an emoji here to see if what it happened, what happens. Let's put this one. Art. Commit. Now it's committed. It says that three files have changed and I made 15 insertions and then we create uh, a tag. Now we can push. It, uh, it says git push origin heads main. Let's go back here to the github repository we can refresh the page now see 40 41 seconds ago i made this commit and now i see the emoji here with the commit message and i can see the changes that i made So now I have this new line here. And I can also add a comment here in this specific line, this specific change. I doubt it. Add single comments. And now I have a comment related to this single change. So another person that is going coming to this project and wants to collaborate, they will see that all the history of collaboration in each file. So they go to this point in time that relates to this change, and then they can reply here 
or they can suggest a modification, anything. And, and I can comment on the whole commit also. Um, any urgent questions? Anything else that you want to know? Maybe. Jeremy has a question in the chat. Yeah, I never tried making tags using either GitHub or R Studio. I only did quite a few times, but using the command line. And they were not useful for me, so I don't think I memorized the command. <laughs> but uh, for everyone, what Jeremy is referring to is uh, tags. You can create tags to kind of organize your commits, right, Jeremy? It's something that you create a text. Yes, git tag, yes. <laughs> um, so it's really useful when you, uh, if you, if you're the kind of person that adds colors and tags in your file organization, in your computer, that's something that might be useful for you. The difference between Paul and clone. Okay, when you git Paul, you are taking the changes that you made in your local repository and you are actually pull is the opposite you are taking the changes that are in your remote repository and kind of informing your computer that these are the new versions that you need in your local repository so it's kind of a download the changes and you update your local changes based on that. When you clone, you are copying the repository. It's, it's something that you do only once when you are initiating a repository. So you copy all the files and initiate a local repository connected to your remote repository. Is it clear? Okay, perfect. <laughs> so PO is a workflow. It's a routine for you to update your local files and cloning is kind of it's like downloading and copying the files um, if you want to add this uh, new information commands and links to your etherpad feel free to do it so Je jeffrey just added uh, the configuring notifications link thank you for that jeffrey to have a better understanding of how git works and the engineer behind it yeah i like the way you explained it. it it's 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 very clear and it's so cool to add oh, the emojis in the in the commit messages yeah that's that's cool <laughs> and especially in our studio even though we didn't get to do the settings um how to connect git to our studio i think that that really helped i'm not used to using git in our studio but i, I will use this this session yes yes myself Mm. Yeah, I've learned about the use this a couple of weeks ago because I never use our studio, and, but it's really, really easy. The package is built to you just put your username, your email, and it, it can also store your keys because now you have to create personal access tokens to connect remote repositories to your local repository. So GitHub can identify that it's you that it's using and it's making modifications. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a really complex password, really big, like 20 characters. Uh, and use these, the package can store this key for you. So you kind of create a password to access these keys. It's really useful. Right, Jeremy is asking, where do we get the pictures oh. from the slides? Right, I forgot to add, but it's from GitLab, for, from uh, Mozilla Science Labs. Thank you so much for that. Um, is there anything else you'd like to uh, finish explaining, Grissel? Uh No, I think that was it. But I'm around if you have any questions, if you need more orientation, this kind of, of things, let me know. Mm -hmm. And thank, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you so much. Obrigado, Grassel. Thank you so much. Everyone liked the presentation. <laughs> thank you. All right. So, if Let me know if you need anything else.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you, members, for joining us. I'd like to give a big shout out to Our Ladies Bergen and Our Ladies uh, Cologne for joining us. It's good to have other clubs seeing what seeing what other clubs are doing. So I hope we'll stay in touch in the future. So yes, guys. Oh, one thing. Could you just also add your Twitter account and your contacts in the chat for everyone to get a hold of you? Yes. So. This is my Twitter handle, and you can email me at the same thing at gmail.com. Thank you, members. Once again, remember to follow us on all the social media platforms. We're on YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter. If you're not in one uh, website, when you, if you're not in one social media, you can follow us in the other, Facebook and GitHub, and we'll get in touch with, we'll send you all the slides, the recording by email, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, everyone.